Good. Then welcome to the welcome back to the Neuralink lecture. Today we want to talk about um, statistical analysis of task-based fMRI data, and this usually operates under the term general linear model. My name is Joran Soch. I'm working in, uh, as a postdoc at the Otto von Gehrke Universität Magdeburg. Um, I was doing my PhD and postdoc at the BCCM with John Del Hayes, so right there. And that's why I'm still giving this lecture today. Um, first things first, so I want to let you know that I am recording this lecture. Um, in order to then later make it available to you for study. And this at the same time means that if you and your voice don't want to be heard um, on the internet, specifically YouTube, you should either not ask questions or then let me know after the lecture that I can maybe cut certain parts from the lecture when uploading it to YouTube. Okay. So uh, this is our plan for today. Um, I'm giving a short introduction in which I want to present you with the software I'm using here for demo and the data set I'm using for illustration. We will then see how we can set up a very simple linear model for this data set, um, specifically for fMRI data recorded under the experiment used in this data set. And we will then generalize this to the um, statistical framework of general linear models. This is section three. And in section four, <coughs> we will uh, have a look at how general linear models need to be modified in order to take care of the specific requirements of uh, functional MRI data. Good, so let's start. Um, this is an overview of fMRI data analysis as a whole. Um, everything that's in the red box on the left is here called pre-processing, so algorithmic corrections um, of the data in order to remove spatial and temporal artifacts, which I think you have heard about in the last session by Kai Gergen. And then everything that's on the blue box on the right uh, is here called statistical analysis, uh, in other words, general linear model. So this is where we specify our model, estimate parameters, and then do statistical inference in order to come up with those nice um, thresholded maps, which then show us which brain regions light up uh, under some condition, and what that means exactly, we will learn today. Okay, so today we will only deal with uh, what's here on the right. And um, I am here using a processing package that is very widely used uh, in the neuroimaging community um, as an illustration for the data analysis steps. This is called Statistical Parametric Mapping, or SPM version 12 in short, which runs on MATLAB. If you open MATLAB and then start SPM, it typically looks like this. Yeah, you here have your three windows. Um, the fact that I am Using SPM for illustration does not mean that this is the best processing package. It does not mean that this is the only processing package. It just happens to be the one that I am using or I was using, and um, therefore I here put it on the slides uh, in case you are also working with SPM. However, there are of course alternatives to um, SPM for GLM based analysis, and in order to let you know about them, I here have listed them. So if you're working with AFNI or FSL, these would be the functions 3D, Convolve, and Feed. If you are uh, working with FreeSurfer, um, which is also an open source software, I think, there the function is called MRI GLM Fit. And if you are working with Python, which I think is becoming more and more common, then the package MyLearn, so machine learning for neural imaging, might be interesting for you. And if you want to run GLM-based analysis in Python, then you will be probably interested in the submodule Nylon GLM. Okay, so with that being said, I'm also having an fMRI data set that I'm here using as a running example. In this experiment, 
subjects were viewing a series of uh, photographs which were either new to them at the time of presentation, so novel images, or the subjects had previously seen them, so they were pre-familiarized a couple of times with those images. These are here called master images. Yeah? The task for the subjects in this experiment was to indicate via button, button press whether they are seeing an indoor or an outdoor image. So it was not related to any memory encoding. However, then after fMRI scanning, I think 70 minutes after this encoding session took place, there was a surprise memory test in which uh, subjects were shown all the novel images from the encoding session which um, were now regarded as old images because they had seen them in the encoding session, as well as a couple of new images that they had not previously seen. And the, task, uh, the participants were then asked to rate all those images on a five-point scale ranging from one for this item is definitely new to me, up to five for I've definitely seen this item in the encoding session. This is what later will be used to operationalize encoding success or subsequent memory because if a subject responds with five to an old image, we can regard them as having remembered the stimulus from the encoding session. Good. Um, so if you're into learning memory with humans <coughs> and fMRI, um, you are very welcome to check out these papers here. So analyses based on this data set have been published in uh, Neuroimage and Human Brain Mapping. So if you're interested in this topic, feel free to uh, check this out and ask me anything you want. Um, good. Are there questions up to this point? No. Fine. So <coughs> we now want to get back to the experimental design of this um, data set specifically what happened during the encoding session where fMRI data were acquired and uh, think about how we can set up a, a rather simple model for analyzing those data. So we don't need this and this and um, I also want you to ignore the indoor outdoor dimension for now. Yeah? So please don't, please forget that those images were different categories and uh, then we basically have two experimental conditions namely novel images and master images. So the novel images would here be our experimental condition of interest because we want to know what happens in the brain during the processing of novel material, previously unseen material, whereas the master images would be our control condition relative to which we want to see how much activity there is for novel images. So we of course know at which point in time which experimental condition was active. <coughs> this is because we have designed the experiment and all this condition timing information is saved into log files after the experiment. These functions here, which are one when an experimental condition is active and zero when an experimental condition is inactive, are called stimulus functions. So they are indicating when the stimulus is present, if you want. And then we um, keep this in mind and um, go back to our pre-processed data set. Yeah? So let's say that these are our um, pre-processed um, fMRI data, a series of scans from a single functional MRI run. And I've here highlighted one voxel using this red crosshair. So one voxel, if you remember, is one of these <coughs> measurement locations in the brain. Each scan consists of tens of thousands of voxels and so on. And I have now here highlighted one voxel. And the idea is now that we go through all these scans and extract the data point from this particular voxel. Yeah? Um, so this would give us the temporal evolution of the bold signal over time. So x here is bold, y is time. And we now want to take this signal, feed it into model specification, then estimate the parameters of the model, and then use this for statistical inference. Uh, so in other words, we also know the bold signal 
because we have measured it and pre-processed it. So what you see here on top as the blue curve should be the output that we get from pre-processing. So you would probably agree that there appears to be some relationship here between the volt signal on top and the stimulus functions in the <coughs> And the question is, how do we now quantify this relationship? And we do this by setting up uh, a rather simple model. And in this model, we assume that the volt signal, which is here given on the left, is a linear combination of experimental, so activity due to experimental condition one, multiplied by some factor, better one, plus activity due to experimental condition two, multiplied by some factor, better two, plus some baseline level of um, neural or hemodynamic activity, um, here called beta 3, plus some random variations, which are also always uh, in, the, in the data and which we cannot um, capture or which we cannot fully get rid of and therefore they have to be in our model. So this model could be summarized using the equation y equals beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 plus beta 3 times x3 plus epsilon. And in this equation, the quantities correspond to the following things. So y would be the volt signal here on the left. x1 and x2 would be the experimental condition regressors. These are the stimulus functions which um, yeah, indicate the presence of experimental conditions. Then X3 would be called the implicit baseline or the constant regressor because it's not changing its value over time. And the epsilon would be um, called the errors for noise curves. So I should say <coughs> that this is a naive model for the single voxel because it ignores um, several important properties of the volt signal, for example, the volt signal uh, does not usually have this shape, but we will see how this can be solved later on. Um, now let's, um, yes, there's a question. Yes, it's just you know, the betas in the previous yeah. equation, it's like the experimental signal, etc. But what was the extra maths you were that you put on the bottom of the course? It's not just experiment one signal, it's like the constant, but not the constant. It's uh, you mean this here, implicit baseline, constant regressor? No, what is like... The condition regressor? That's the word I'm looking for. Thank yeah, you. that was yeah. Uh, what x1 and x2 were. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, so um, I forgot to say, um, I'm planning to talk for around 60 to 70 minutes, so you should have enough questions to ask. But no, you should have enough time to ask questions in between. You shouldn't have so many questions. I, I'm happy to answer questions, but um, I'm of course also happy. My, my talking is uh, rather clear to you, so um, you can always interrupt me and ask questions in between, and if we are happy, we will also have some additional time at the end. Good, so um, let's now, um, despite this simple model having limitations, um, consider that we are working with this model and then um, think about how we can calibrate those betters, better one, better two, better three in the equation. And um, for that, I'm here providing a heuristic idea. So um, in blue, I'm plotting the measured signal, which does not change. And in red, I'm plotting the modeled signal, which uh, changes as a function of how we choose our better correlations. Yeah? This is the output of the model. And you would probably agree with me that here on top, um, the betas would be too small in the sense that the modeled signal is systematically lower than the, than the measured signal, whereas here in the bottom um, it is fairly clear that um, the betas are too large in the sense that the modeled signal is systematically larger than the measured signal. So uh, what we here have in the middle would correspond to the optimal betas uh, in the sense that the modeled signal is neither systematically lower nor systematically higher than the measured signal. Yeah? So this is what we want in the end, that the residuals, so the difference between modeled and measured signal is on average zero. And this would then correspond to the best fit of the model to the data. Once again, 
this is a naive view of parameter estimation because uh, it's, it's not, not yet a principled mathematical approach by which we can calculate those better. But we will see such an approach later. Now, let's consider that we have performed statistical inference and we want to denote um, the estimated beta coefficients as beta hat i. So this would be the estimated value of the coefficient beta i. Yeah? Then it could be that we <coughs> obtain the following values. Um, beta hat 3 is around 100, as you can see here. Um, beta hat 1 is 9.82, and beta 2 hat is 5.07. Then what we could do is we can subtract beta 2 from beta 1, which is 4.75. So we can say, we could say, this is larger than 0, therefore experimental condition 1 elicits larger activity than experimental condition Therefore, there's a positive effect of processing novel stimuli on the signal. Yeah. And one more time, this is a naive view of statistical inference because um, it would pretend that we can ignore the residual variability of the signal, which is, um, which, which is also in the signal and um, which we have to take into account how much noise there is when we want to do statistical inference. And we will see later on how this can be incorporated into the statistics. So this was the rather easy, simple introduction. Are there questions up to this point? OK, so um, if not, we're getting a bit more advanced now because we want to generalize um, this model to a framework which can um, yeah, take care of, of, um, of arbitrary cases in a sense. So we want to generalize this regression model with two conditions to um, a multiple linear regression model <coughs> um, which can have an arbitrary number of experimental conditions and which can also include potential other variables which are influencing the signal. Additionally, we need to make some assumptions about the errors or the noise in the signal in order, we need to make probabilistic assumptions in order to uh, enable us to perform a statistical inference. Good, so the result of these considerations is called the general linear model or GLM in short. And in the GLM, the bold signal in a single voxel, which is here given as the n by one vector y, is decomposed into variation from experimental conditions and potential confounds, which are collectively referred to as the design matrix X, same number of rows, P comes, weighted by some regression <coughs> conditions, beta, so this is a P by one vector, plus noise terms, epsilon, which are assumed to follow a uh, multivariate normal distribution with mean zero and a covariance matrix sigma square times the identity matrix, where sigma square is what is here called the noise variance. Okay, so this GLM approach is very powerful because if we have any other new variable which we think is influencing the signal, we can just add them as new columns to the design matrix, so they simply become an additional regressor. And this design matrix X should ideally embody all the knowledge that we have about ex uh, experimental factors on the one hand, so things that are under control during the experiment, as well as potential confounds, mm. so things that are not under our control but that we maybe have measured, such as um, the subject's movement or um, physiological signals heart rate, respiration, things like that. Yeah? Okay, so when it comes to the uh, noise terms, we assume those to be independent and identically distributed according to a normal distribution with mean zero and unknown variance. This is called the IID assumption, where IID stands for independent and identically distributed. Okay, so I was previously using this display of the GLM when introducing our simple two 
condition <coughs> model. And here, um, time is on the y-axis. And we have our different predictors. Um, this is a rather unconventional display of a linear model. So what you are uh, likely to see more often is such a display where the design matrix is visualized as a grayscale color plot. And then um, typically the data vector and the residual vector are also omitted from this display because they are changing from voxel to voxel anyway. And then what you could see in, an, um, in a processing package is something like this. So this is a real design matrix from SPM and we will later see what all these um, column vectors correspond to. Is that a question? Good. Uh, there's an interesting interpretation of the GLM which uh, also allows to motivate a first attempt at parameter estimation. And this interpretation is called the geometric perspective. So in the geometric perspective, we consider the columns of the design matrix to be vectors. And we then consider the di design space. So the design space is the hyperdimensional space which is spanned by the column vectors of the design matrix. So if our design matrix would have two columns, this would be the design space and you have to imagine this as the set of all points in n-dimensional space that, <coughs> can, that can be reached by multiplying the design matrix with some arbitrary vector of regression potentials. Yeah? So the set of all signals that our model can capture. Now the actually measured signal will typically be outside the design space. Otherwise, there would not be any noise. And this is very rarely the case. Actually, this is never the case with empirical data. Yeah? And um, now the question is, how do we pick our model signal? The model signal must be some point on the design space. But um, how do we uh, choose this relative to the measured data? And the solution to this is <coughs> to um, choose the model signal x times beta hat, such that the um, residual error is minimal, so that um, we find the point which has the shortest distance between design space and measured signal. We can use this insight to also motivate uh, first parameter estimation technique for the GLM, which is called Ordinary Least Squares, or OLS. The objective here is to minimize the sum of squared errors. And um, if you are a bit familiar with linear algebra, um, you might know that the sum of squared errors is simply proportional to the length of this vector, the error vector. And um, from this, one can deduce that the vector of residuals must be orthogonal to the design space. Yeah? If you imagine the vector of residuals to be different, let's say this vector here, so one that is not orthogonal to the design space, then there would be another point on the design space which is closer to the measured signal. And therefore, the vector of residuals must be orthogonal to the design space, and that is what we capture in this equation. You might remember from high school mathematics that for some for two vectors to be orthogonal to each other, their scalar product must be zero, and this is what we are here um, saying <coughs> for the residual vector and each vector, each column vector of the design matrix. Okay, now we can input the um, vector of residuals. The vector of residuals is the difference between measured signal and the modeled or predicted signal. You can read this from this visualization. Y is x beta hat plus epsilon hat. So we can um, subtract uh, x beta hat and then we get epsilon hat and plug it in here. And now we can simply do some manipulations on this formula and solve it for beta hat um, in order to obtain the parameter estimates. Yeah? So we here have x transpose y minus x times beta hat. So what we do first is to multiply this out. Then we have x transpose y minus x transpose x beta hat equals zero. Then we 
bring this to the other side. So this gives us x transpose x better hat equal to x transpose y. Now we um, multiply from the left with the matrix x transpose x inverse x transpose x better hat x transpose x inverse x transpose y on the other side. So what happens now? Is there, are there any mathematicians in the audience? Or maybe mathematically well-trained neuroscientists? I guess you just cross out the ones that are on both sides. Um, which ones? Like x, t, x, and then the same thing on the other Sure, but this, this is what we have just multiplied with. So I think uh, what would end up with then is this step. And we want to uh, isolate that head. So this is some matrix, and this is the inverse of this matrix. So maybe it was this what you were referring to. And if you multiply a matrix with its inverse, the result <coughs> is the identity matrix, and the identity matrix disappears from a matrix product such that this is then our solution. Yeah? So better head is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So if you want to uh, take home one equation from this lecture, it should be this, um, the ordinary square solution <coughs> for the better parameter. You should, of course, also remember the GLM equation itself. Yeah? Um, so this is probably the most important um, equation here in this lecture today. Um, question? Yes. In general, when you have paths, what does that mean? Hat means yeah. estimated. estimated. So um, okay. this is just uh, a notation to indicate that we have, yes. that we are not referring to the true value of beta, but to the okay. estimated value. Yeah? So beta hat would be the estimated value. Um, x times beta hat would be the model signal, so what the model predicts. Um, y minus x times beta hat would be epsilon hat, so the estimated noise term. And so on and so Okay, so with that, we can now come to statistical inference. And um, statistical inference in the GLM is often contrast based inference. So um, this is based on T contrasts and F contrasts. And the T contrast is specified by a P times 1 contrast vector C. So this is a vector which has the same dimensionality as the beta vector. And this vector is often visualized on top of the design matrix in order to associate the contrast weights with the columns of the design matrix. Yeah? In this case, the contrast vector is plus 1, minus 1, 0. So if you multiply this with the beta parameter vector, you get beta 1 minus beta 2. Which means that this T contrast is asking the research, research question whether there is a difference between beta 1 and beta 2. So is there a difference between the regressors, uh, between the first and the second regressor? Or more precisely, in the weights associated with the first and the second regressor? <coughs> um, which in this case could simply be the difference between two experimental conditions. Yeah? And um, an F contrast is specified by a contrast matrix, which can also be visualized on top of the design matrix. In this case, the contrast matrix is a 3 times 2 matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So um, if we multiply <coughs> this with the beta parameter vector, we get a 2 by 1 vector, beta 1, beta 2, which means that the research question implied by this covariance matrix is whether there is an effect of the first or the second regressor, or an effect of both of them. <coughs> Good, so there's some statistical theory which I'm now briefly reviewing before we can see how we actually do statistical inference. In T contrasts, um, the quantity of interest is the contrast value, C transposed times beta hat. So this is a scalar, a single real number. And um, the null hypothesis is that this contrast value is zero. 
So for example, that there's no difference between exponent and partitions. Consequently, the alternative is that the contrast value is non-zero, and because t-tests in SPM are typically one-sided, uh, it would here mean that the contrast value is positive. Now, fortunately, there is a test statistic here, the t-value, which under the null hypothesis follows a t-distribution with degrees of freedom n minus p. And we'll see in a minute how we can use this for statistical inference. With respect to f contrasts, <coughs> the quantity of interest is the vector of contrast values. So this is now a vector because C is a matrix and not a vector. And the null hypothesis is that all contrast values are zero. For example, that all um, that all um, condition weights beta one and beta two are zero. What is the negation of a conjunction? So um, now we need philosophers in the audience. Logicians, please to the front. What is uh, such a statement not A and B equivalent to? It's not A or not B. Exactly. The negation of the conjunction is the disjunction of the negations. Yeah? This means that uh, the alternative hypothesis, which, which is the negation of the null hypothesis, states that at least one contrast value is non-zero. Yeah? Either the first, or the second, or the third, and so on. And once again, there is a test statistic, the f value, which under the null hypothesis follows the f probability distribution with degrees of freedom q, which comes from the dimensionality of the contrast matrix, and n minus p, which again comes from the dimensionality of the design matrix. So now you might wonder, what is this all good for? Um, what do I personally gain from these test statistics following certain probability distributions? Well, it has some consequences for statistical inference, namely that we can calculate p-values. Yeah? So this here, the solid black line on the left side, would correspond to the t-distribution that the t-statistic follows if the null hypothesis was true. And then we additionally have our actually observed test statistic, the t-value. We are now interested in the probability under the null hypothesis of observing a test statistic which is as extreme or more extreme than the actually observed value which we have calculated for our concrete data set. This is um, the area here in red. Yeah? And if this area is sufficiently small, for example, smaller than 0.05, then we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative. For example, that there is a statistically significant difference between two experimental conditions. Good, same holds for F contrasts. So once again, we have the distribution under the null hypothesis as the black line. Um, we calculate the probability that the F value is as extreme or more extreme than the obtained value. This red area, this is called the P value. <coughs> p-value -vol is smaller than the significance level, then we reject the null hypothesis. Questions up to this point? Yes? Could you clarify what the n and p are in the formulas? Yes, n and p are the dimensions of the design market. So when I was showing you the general um, linear model, this one here. Yeah. So, um, why is an n by one vector? Meaning that there are n observations, typically n fMRI scans during a single one, say 100 or 200. And the design matrix needs to have the same number of rows because it makes a prediction for each entry in the data vector. And p is the number of predictors in the design matrix. So, n and p are the dimensions of the design matrix, and according to the statistics theorem, if you prove that and go through the derivations, you find that these numbers also enter the parameters of the uh, t-distribution here, 
and the F distribution here. Yeah? Thank you. Okay. Good. So, if there are no more questions, then we can go on to find out how um, general linear models need to be equipped in order to be fit for functional MRI data. You know that um, subject matter expertise beats machine learning, beats coding, and therefore you have to know a bit about the type of the data you are working with. And uh, I want to here discuss this in the form of problems or extensions that we want to solve. And for each of these problems, I want to ask three questions. Why does the problem exist? How is the problem dealt with mathematically? And what do the results look like um, if we apply the problem solution? Good. The first of these problems is low frequency drifts. So typically there are uh, slow trends in the measured and pre-processed fMRI signals, which are due to scanner properties, and when which can make uh, the model estimation inaccurate if they are not being accounted for. The solution for these frequency low frequency trends here is that we build a discrete cosine or DCT set shown here on the bottom right and regress this out of the signal. This is called temporal filtering. Um, so let's let this on the left here be the um, pre-processed signal. You can see that this has a linear upward trend and also a mild quadratic trend in it. And then in the middle we here have the DCT matrix. Each in the DCT matrix is embodying one temporal frequency, so basically a sinusoidal curve over time, and you can also see that the frequency is doubling from one regressor to the next. Yeah? And then what we do is we take this design matrix X0, calculate the better estimates according to our theorem of best fit, which are here called beta hat zero, and then we subtract the predicted signal, signal predicted from these temporal frequencies, from the preprocessed signal, and this gives us our signal which we actually give into the general linear model. So what we see here on the right would correspond to the filtered signal with the temporal trends being removed. <coughs> um, so how do you do this in SPM? Um, if you want to specify uh, a general linear model analysis, you have to choose the module fMRI model specification. And here under scans, you basically input the fMRI scans from preprocessing. And then there's a property called high pass filter, which here is 128 seconds, uh, which means that frequencies with a period longer than this value, which are rather slow frequencies, um, are being removed from the signal. Yeah? So depending on how you choose this value, the DCT matrix X0 will be created in order to regress out those frequencies. Okay, next problem is the hemodynamic response. Because as you can imagine, the fMRI signal does not have such a rectangular shape that we were assuming when we were setting up our simple single voxel model, and in fact, the hemodynamic response is more complex, and it's characterized by what is called the HRF, the hemodynamic response function. So if this here at time zero is stimulus presentation, the response of a brain region measured with fMRI typically peaks at around five to six seconds after stimulus onset, then there is some post-stimulus undershoot here between around 10 to 25 seconds after stimulus onset before the signal is back to normal at around 30 seconds after stimulus onset. And what we do is uh, we take this um, hemodynamic response function and simply convolve our stimulus functions with the HRF in order to achieve a more realistic prediction of the fMRI signal. So the stimulus functions of our true experimental conditions are here given on the left. And in the middle, you can see the hemodynamic response function. 
if we extract it from SPM using a certain temporal resolution, delta T, and um, the convolving the stimulus functions with the HF then results in the actual regressors, which look similar, a kind of smeared out versions of the stimulus function with using the HF as a filter. So here's a visualization of convolution that you can find on Wikipedia, and it hopefully gives you an intuition of how that works. So we have one function here in blue, and we take uh, a filter here given in red, and move it across the function that we want to convolve at each time point, multiply, add this up, and then this then gives us the convolved signal, where the example that we here have in the bottom probably is closer to um, our example in the HF. Good. How do you implement the HF in SPM? So first of all, you have to provide SPM with your experimental condition information. This is here given under multiple conditions in the form of MAT files. And um, then under basis functions, you can choose the basis function that you want to convolve your stimulus function with. And um, here I selected the canonical HF, which is the um, HF that I showed you on one of the previous slides. Good. So um, this then gives us an actual design matrix. And the actual design matrix is here shown on the top right. Mm, I'm specifying a T contrast, which is calculating the difference between the first and the third regressor. I will tell you about more about the second regressor in a while. Um, so the first regressor is novel images, the third regressor is master <coughs> images. In other words, um, I'm asking the question whether there's more activity during the presentation of novel material relative to activity during the presentation of non-novel material. Yeah? And if we run this contrast, we indeed find uh, voxels in the single subject analysis. Um, I think this is cerebellum or maybe hippocampus, where indeed um, there is a difference between um, novel and non-novel. Good. Next problem is residual movement effects. So even if we have performed um, spatial realignment during preprocessing, see um, last week's or second last week's lecture, um, there are uh, still movement artifacts in the signal, especially at tissue boundaries. Yeah? This is, um, the spatial realignment removes some of the movement, but cannot remove the movement completely. And uh, what we do in order to solve this is that we take the realignment parameter that we have obtained as an output from spatial realignment and preprocessing and simply add, add them as additional columns to the design matrix. So this is how this looks. We here have our design matrix consisting only of condition regressors and an implicit baseline, a constant regressor. And in the middle, we here have the translation and the rotation parameters. So um, this means that there are six parameters for translation along each axis and rotation around each axis. Yeah? So this is where these six head movement parameters come from. And uh, these are also scan-wise, so they are n by one vectors, if you want, such that we can add them as additional colors. And this then gives us the augmented design matrix, which also accounts for residual movement effects. Good. Um, in SPM, there is a feature called multiple regressors, which uh, allows you to basically enter any other covariate predictor confound that you uh, that you um, have available on a scan by scan basis. Since the realignment parameters are calculated for each scan, we can also enter them here using this feature. Um, I have here, uh, so here we have again our design matrix on the bottom right, and I have now specified an F contrast 
across all this, all these um, movement parameter regressors. This is called an omnibus F test because you're basically testing for all the effects using one contrast. And if you remember the logics of F contrasts, we should see a voxel light up if at least one of these movement parameters has an effect on the measured signal across the, yeah, uh, across the entire run. And these are the voxels that we find. So you can very nicely see that here at the boundaries between um, gray matter and CSF, we uh, typically have voxels which have variants that can be accounted for by including the um, realignment parameters into the model. And this then um, improves the uh, signal explanation. This reduces the noise variance um, or the residual variance to be more precise. And this then improves our T and F statistics so that we increase the statistical power of our analysis. Good. Next problem is uh, serial autocorrelations. So um, fMRI data are time series. Um, we are measuring um, changes in blood flow over time. And as such signals, consecutive fMRI scans are not statistically independent from each other. So what happens during one scan has an effect on what happens during the next scan, and possibly the next scan, and maybe even the next scan, depending on how you choose your TR. And um, this is because the, the brain is, of course, a dynamical system, and it can be described by, by differential equations. And differential equations have the consequence that you have serial correlations between adjacent time points. Um, we here solve this model, solve this problem by revising the model. So we give up the IID assumption and instead fit an autoregressive model of order one, AR1 model, to account for these serial correlations. So here's a little bit of background for this. Um, we are typically making the sphericity assumption in GLM analysis, which means that the errors are independent and identically distributed, and which is equivalent to saying that the error covariance is a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. This is the two-dimensional identity matrix here, and um, we typically call these distributions spherical distributions, or we call this the sphericity assumption, because if you plot the um, probability density function of such a distribution, um, it looks like uh, it has this circular or spherical shape if you are in higher dimensions. And this is why this is called the sphericity assumption. So there are several ways in which sphericity can be violated. One of them is non-identity. Non-identity would mean that we have different amounts of variance for different time points. Yeah? The variance on the x-axis here is higher than on the y-axis. And the other one is non-independence. So this means that we have uh, non-zero off-diagonal entries in the <coughs> variance matrix, such that this does not hold. And um, this then leads to a positive or negative correlation between um, the noise terms in adjacent fMRI scales. Um, how do we solve this problem? We um, give up our independent and identically distributed noise model and replace it by an enhanced noise model in which the covariance matrix is replaced by a matrix V. And this matrix V is a mixture of different covariance components. Yeah? So this Q1 here is an identity matrix and would model the IID process, whereas this Q2 here is modeling this, the amount of serial correlations in the data. They are multiplied with uh, hyperparameters, lambda 1, lambda 2. These are estimated from the data in order to generate the matrix V. And then the matrix V is used to improve the parameters for, um, yeah, the, the improve the parameter estimation for our linear regression model and come up with parameters which account for the serial correlations. Okay, um, 
in SKM, if you want to take care of serial autocorrelations, you have to go to the feature serial correlations and there pick AR1. Simple as that. And the next problem is multiple comparisons. This is probably the problem that you have to be most aware of, and not just when you're working with fMRIs, but in any other data analysis where you have multiple, <coughs> multiple models or multiple outcome variables that you're analyzing. So the issue here is that when running many parallel statistical tests, there will inevitably a large number of spurious findings. Yeah? To understand this, we go back a bit into the theory of um, into the theory of statistical hypothesis testing. So here, this solid line is showing the distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis, and the dashed line is corresponding to the distribution of the test statistic under the alternative hypothesis, which is unknown. But the idea generally is that we pick a significance level alpha. The significance level alpha results in some critical value, vertical line here, which then um, defines a region of test statistics in which we reject the null hypothesis. Yeah? So in other words, if the null hypothesis is rejected if the p-value is smaller than alpha, then this alpha here is the probability of a false positive result. That is, of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is in fact true. Yeah? With null hypothesis significance testing, we are controlling the false positive rate. We cannot eliminate the false positive rate. We can just um, restrict it to some acceptable level. And this acceptable level is typically 5%, which is why we use alpha equal to 0 0.05. And um, let's now think about what consequences this has for multiple testing across thousands of voxels in the brain. So if we are running one test, the probability of a false positive is alpha. So the probability of no false positive is one minus alpha. If we are running a second test in another voxel, the probability of obtaining no false positives is one minus alpha squared. If we are running a third test in another voxel, the probability to have no false positives is one minus alpha to the power of three. And so on and so forth. And we generalize this by introducing the term family-wise error rate. So the family-wise error, or FWE, is defined as the probability to have one or more false positives. So this would be the converse of this event, to have no false positives. Um, in N statistical tests. So for independent statistical tests, this family-wise error rate is given by one minus one minus alpha to the power of n. So just the inverse of this probability. Yeah? I'm here graphing this function for n to 100. Yeah? And you can see that as soon we reach 100 statistical tests, the family-wise error rate is virtually 1. <coughs> so if you're running 100 statistical tests, you would almost surely have at least one false positive result. Um, and please keep in mind that in fMRI data analysis, we can have several tens of thousand boxes uh, in one fMRI scan, and we are running um, mass univariate analysis, so we, we are performing parallel statistical tests. There are several uh, corrections available for this multiple comparison problem, which are called the Bonferroni correction and the Bonferroni correction, which is probably the more well-known one. <coughs> and they work by simply adjusting the significance level. Uh, the advantage of these corrections is that they are very easy to implement, but the disadvantage is that they are, in practice, too conservative. 
So they um, typically, um, uh, so by applying these directions, you lose power by not rejecting enough null hypotheses. And um, this is because, in practice, parallel tests are usually not independent. This especially holds for fMRI voxels, which are highly correlated, neighboring voxels are highly correlated, due to physiology, they have spatial correlation, and therefore our parallel statistical tests are typically not independent. We want to account for this in order to not apply a criterion which is too conservative. <coughs> so, <coughs> the solution to this in fMRI data analysis is called Gaussian random field theory or RFT. So it starts from the observation or from the assumption that the noise is correlated in neighboring voxels. This is in part due to the physiology of the brain and in part due to spatial smoothing, which we ourselves have applied in pre-processing, um, um, which you've learned about two weeks ago. And uh, the idea is now to take these voxel dependencies in, into account to come up with a criterion which is not as conservative as bond Veroni correction. And the, uh, mathematically, we create a model of the joint distribution of the noise across voxels, across multiple voxels, and use this to quantify the voxel dependencies. The result of this procedure then is very, very loosely speaking, that we do not correct uh, our alpha for the number of voxels, which would be way too conservative, but we correct it for the number of results, where results are resolution elements. So you can think of this as the effective spatial resolution. Yeah? Um, a um, brain size might consist of 100 voxels, but effectively, due to correlations between the voxels, these might only be 25 voxels, as an example. And um, <coughs> this quantity, the number of resolution elements, is estimated uh, in SPM's GLM procedure and saved as the image RPV results per voxel, which is then used for multiple comparison correction. Good, if you want to implement multiple comparison correction in SPM, you simply choose FWE, so family-wise error correction, then enter your um, desired p-value, and then um, also enter an extends threshold, which is the number of neighboring voxels which need to be activated in order for a cluster to be considered significant. <clears throat> okay, here's an example for multiple comparison correction. So, um, on the, um, we are looking at this contrast, novel, larger than master images, again. And on the left, we have uncorrected statistical inference, so no correction for multiple comparisons, with uh, a rather low p-value 0 0.001. Whereas on the right, we have applied um, FWE correction at the whole brain level and set our p-value to 0 0.05. And you can probably see that in the uncorrected analysis, there are many more voxels and partly even clusters which are um, found as being activated and which are likely to be false positives according to this, this uh, procedure. Good. If there are no questions, I additionally want to come to two extensions which you can do to the GLM approach. The first of these extensions being parametric modulators. So sometimes in an experiment, you have a variable which is um, varying on a trial-to-trial -trial basis and which might also influence the signal. This can, for example, be stimulus strengths, so the intensity of uh, an auditory or visual stimulus. It can also be the emotional balance of a picture being shown. It can be reaction time. So any continuous variable that varies from trial to trial and might influence the signal is a modulator variable. And how do we take, uh, take them into account in a general linear model? We add them as parametric modulator regressors. So we here on the left have the stimulus function of an experimental condition and 
implement the physics function of an associated modulator variable. So this modulator variable in this case is varying between minus one and one, and it receives the same timing information because it belongs to this experiment definition. Yeah? Then we take these two, convolve them with the hemodynamic response function, and this gives us an onset regressor, which models the presence of the experimental condition as such, and a parametric modulator regressor, which uh, models variation due to the modulator variable. So, um, if we if we assume these two regressors to receive the weights ten <coughs> and five, um, we can now multiply the regressors with those values and add them up. And this well, then would give us this possibly possible response, so one prediction of the model, if the weights would be like this. And you can very nicely see that um, there is an average peak response, which is basically captured by this onset regressor, and that the parametric modulator allows to capture variation um, around this average peak response, so sometimes a higher, sometimes a lower response. Always, of course, under the condition that the parametric variable has an effect, which can, but doesn't need to be necessarily the case. Good. If you want to implement parametric modulators in SPM, you have to input them along with the experimental timing information. So you have your names, onsets, and durations for each experimental condition. And there you can also add uh, the parametric modulators should there exist some for the experimental conditions. So here's an example, for per a very interesting example, in my eyes, for parametric modulator regressors. So um, we have the first and the third regressor, which correspond to the presentation of Nofilic and Master images. And I was also telling you that the novel images are being shown again to the participants, and participants are asked to rate them um, on a five-point scale, um, depending on how well they remember them. We can now take these numbers, which, by the way, are given by the subjects after fMRI scanning, yeah, and mean-center them and add them as parametric modulator, and this is what now becomes the second regressor here. <coughs> This is the second regressor here because it's a parametric modulator that belongs to the novelty condition and therefore comes after the first regressor. So um, I'm here specifying a T-contrast which has a 1 for this second regressor which means I'm simply asking whether the parametric modulator regressor has a non-zero effect on the signal. And indeed, um, if you threshold, you find some voxels which um, show this effect. This, I think, is the hippocampus, which is typically seen on this contrast because uh, hippocampal activity varies as a function of whether a subject later remembers the stimulus or not. Good. And the second extension um, that we want to talk about is second level GLMs. Because usually, you don't want to just show effects for single subjects, but you want to provide evidence for, for example, activation difference um, and, uh, on a group level, yeah? so for multiple subjects. You want to make statements about the population of subjects, and for that, obviously, you need to perform multi-subject analysis. So uh, here, we again build on the framework of the general linear model and implement second level GLMs where the data consists of the contrast estimates we have obtained from the first level and where the design matrix is specified in a way that we implement one out of various designs. So if, for example, you want to run a one sample t-test, you can simply let your design matrix be a vector of ones. If you want to do a two sample t-test, your design matrix would have to look like this. Then there's paired t-test, uh, you can also run multiple regression analysis, and there are design matrix configurations if you are running one or two-way analysis of variance. 
Um, in SPM, this is all uh, specified in the module factorial design specification. So this is what you can use for second level GLMs. And there you have um, the um, selection where you can choose from one out of several designs, such as uh, one sample, two sample t-tests, and ANOVAs. Here, I am running a two sample t-test between um, a group of young subjects aged 18 to 35 and a group of older subjects aged 60 plus, I think. Yeah. And as dependent variable, I was using the um, contrast I just showed you, so the um, subsequent memory contrast, which quantifies to what extent the activity varies as a function of later <coughs> recognition success. Yeah? And if you contrast this between young and older subjects, you find that there, is, um, that there are eight related differences in a large network from um, temporal to occipital up to parietal cortex, where there are indeed differences um, in terms of how strong the activity differs um, between later remembered and later forgotten items between young and older adults. So, are there questions up to this point? This was a lot of information, I think. Um, did you have time to digest this? Are there questions related to functional MRI or the general theory? So then let me give you a brief outlook on what um, expects you, I think, next week uh, in the lecture. But before, I want to here summarize um, um, the whole fMRI data analysis, so what we have learned last in this session. So we have our fMRI scans, and we will perform uh, several pre-processing steps, including slice timing and realignment, and uh, co registration segmentation, normalization, smoothing. And this then gives us our pre-processed fMRI scans. <coughs> scans then enter model specification along with the design matrix and the realignment process in order to take care of all the experimentally controlled as well as non-controlled confounds in the signal. Then we estimate the parameters of this model, um, the beta images, the residual variance, and from the beta images we can calculate contrast images, and then we will perform voxel-wise statistical inference, which gives us those um, thresholded statistical maps, which um, yeah, in popular science literature are often described as brain regions lighting up under some cognitive process, and which, as you now know, um, correspond to a statistical comparison between one condition of interest and a condition of no interest. So this then is um, the area of statistical analysis for task-based fMRI data. And um, you can do more with general linear models. You can um, not just specify condition-wise general linear models, but also trial-wise general linear models. And in such trial-wise general linear models, you have one regressor not for each experimental condition, but one for each trial. Which then means that you also get um, one better parameter estimate for each trial, which possibly allows to do trial-wise decoding from FMI, for example, deciding whether the subject was in experimental condition A or B. Uh, however, if you use this approach, you have to be careful because um, the trial by trial, um, trial by trial parameter estimates tend to be correlated if um, the trials are nearby in time, simply because the HF regressors from these trials are overlapping, which then induces correlation into the estimates. If you want to take care of this, you have to additionally calculate the trial by trial covariance matrix and uh, uh, incorporate this into another linear model in order to account for the trial-wise correlations. If you want to know more about this, um, 
and uh, linear decoding from fMRI, we can have a look at the second paper here. Yeah. Why are there more observations than guides in the um, I think in this, I mean, you cannot be entirely sure because um, there are no numbers here, but I think it was around 200 scans and 100 trials. So n equal to 200, p equal to 100. I'm not entirely sure about the numbers, but you can have a look into it. <coughs> so this is the whole area of trial-wise decoding from fMRI, and this also relates to the issue of multivariate um, pattern analysis, or multivoxel pattern analysis, how it is sometimes called, MVPA. And here the goal is to depart from our mass univariate approach of analyzing the data voxel by voxel separately and instead look at the joint distribution of the data points um, for several voxels at the same time. Yeah? Here this is shown for two voxels, but often these multivariate analyses um, incorporate hundreds of voxels or even all voxels from the brain. And then the goal typically is to find some separating hyperplane in order to, in this multivoxel space, separate the two experimental conditions and in this way also predict for previously unseen data points whether the subject is in experimental condition one or two. So um, if you want to learn more about this whole issue of pattern-based and multivariate analysis, you can have a look at these two papers and you will also have another lecture on this next week, I think, given by John Dylan Haynes. So with that, um, I would be done, and I'm open for questions, if there are any more questions. that have arised while I was talking. Okay. Not even exam questions. <laughs> like, will this be asked in the exam? Okay, yeah, if there are no more questions, then we are done for today. Thank you for the attention. Question. I mean, you know that this is a multiple choice exam. Yeah? So uh, when going through slides, you also have to think about <coughs> what can actually be asked in a multiple choice exam. For example, I cannot ask you for the derivation of the ordinarily squares around this. It wouldn't make sense because um, it's a multiple choice question. And um, I think, um, yeah, so um, there, are, there are important formulas that you should have in mind. Yeah? For example, the formula of the GLM itself, y equals x beta plus epsilon. 
uh, this is important, and uh, the equation for estimating the OLS parameter estimates um, is also important, but generally the questions will be more about the principles, yeah? so what is the theory, what is the idea behind it, um, the idea being we describe linear combinations, we assume our signal to be linear combination of sources of variation plus noise. This is the general idea behind this, and this is um, what, yeah, what you can expect in exam questions. But the problems that I was discussing here, hemodynamic response, movement artifacts, are also important, and um, there might be questions about this, but the questions are uh, not yeah, equation-based, the questions are <coughs> more often um, related to the concepts behind it. What is the problem? How is it being solved? Yeah. Okay, then once again, thank you very much. Thank you.